Hi, I'm Lisa Savage, candidate for U.S. Senate, uh, running under ranked choice voting against Susan Collins here in Maine. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the third in our The Way Forward webinar series on issues of the day. We have a very important issue uh, today. We're going to be talking about Medicare for All, expanded improved single payer health care, and we have three great presenters with us um, to help us do that. So thanks everyone who is able to join us today. Um, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Margaret Flowers, who's been involved with the National Movement for Single Payer for quite some time. And we are going to be hearing from Glenn Simpson, who works in the recovery um, community and has some interesting um, art perspectives to share with us. I know many of our presenters uh, and many of our uh, audience will enjoy that aspect. And we're also going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Bill Clark, who is uh, with Maine All Care, which as many of you know, is the state level effort for um, single payer health care. And so very excited to have everyone with us today. And um, people that are joining us for the first time, here's how our webinars work. We'll be hearing from each of the three presenters with and looking at their slides for uh, about 10 minutes each or so. And you, the audience, will have a chance in the Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A function of this webinar on Zoom to pose questions. So as they come up for you, please put them right into the Q&A. Also, the audience will have an opportunity to upvote other people's questions. So our campaign manager, Chris Kayer, is here uh, behind the scenes, and he will be evaluating which questions seem to have the most audience interest, and he will be um, feeding those questions to us at the last 30 minutes or so of this 90-minute uh, webinar. We also have behind the scenes our comms director, Dave Schwab. He's live streaming to Facebook on the Lisa Savage for U.S. Senate page. So you can see it there afterwards as a recording right away. And we will also put the recording up on YouTube within a day or two for sharing. And also we have uh, the most important person behind the scenes is Kelly Merrill. She's our field manager, and she is a webinar and Zoom uh, wizard, so she's the one that makes all these moving parts come together and work for us so that we can do this um, presentation for you. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Dr. Margaret Flowers is a pediatrician who practiced for 17 years. Currently, she's an advisor to the Board of Physicians for National Health Program, and she's a co-founder in her own state of the Maryland Healthcare is a Human Right campaign. She also co-directs Popular Resistance, which some of you know is a great progressive um, uh, news source and news digest, and she's the co-host of Clearing the Fog Radio. She also runs the Health Over Profit for Everyone, the HOPE campaign, and she's also active in the Green Party, just completing her term as national co-chair, and she also ran for the Senate in Maryland in 2016. So welcome, Dr. Flowers. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. So I've been asked to talk about National Improved Medicare for All and kind of the environment that we're in. And this is a talk that I typically give in about an hour, but it's going to be a very short version. So um, if I don't touch on everything, I apologize. And we'll hopefully get to that in some of the Q&A. Let's go to the first slide, please. So uh, Lisa asked me to talk a little bit about the history, and there's three kind of key points, I think, to cover. One big turning point for the world, really, was in the 1940s with the destruction of World War II. Many countries had to rebuild, and as they rebuilt, they rebuilt their structures so that, you know, healthcare and other things like education were seen as a public good and treated as a human right or a public good. In the United States, we had actually um, frozen wages during World War II, and so employers started adding health care benefits in order to attract employees, and this forged this link between health care and employment, which was kind of a fluke of nature. It was never meant to be you know, part of an actual health care system, but here we are today with that same employer you know, health insurance link. Next slide. In the 1980s, and actually starting in the mid-1970s under Nixon with the passage of the Health Maintenance Organization Act that allowed corporations to profit from medicine, but really under President Reagan in the 1980s, there was a real shift to treating healthcare as a commodity. Uh, that was around the time that I was doing medical school, and I remember where we were told to 
you know, entities were told to not talk about patients as patients, they were consumers or clients and really adding business language into the healthcare field. And during that time, um, investment corporations were brought into the Department of Health and Human Services and trained on how to take on healthcare as a profit-making venture. Let's go to the next slide. And then of course, 2009 um, was when we had the big health reform process in Congress and I volunteered as a congressional fellow during that time. So I was down in Congress quite a bit. And um, I think that this cover from The Lancet, a medical journal in the UK sums it up very well. The healthcare reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the US government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. We saw through the hearings and the meetings that we attended that they were inviting big business, pharma, insurance companies, business roundtable. They were the ones who had a voice and influence over the legislation. And when we tried to introduce experts, we were actually stopped from doing that and even arrested for standing up uh, against that. Let's go to the next slide. So when we look at the wealthy countries in the world, this is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Democracy. Um, this shows the various countries in terms of what percentage of their population is covered. So that's the bar at the bottom from zero to 100%. And then using different colors, how much of their healthcare is financed through public financing and how much is through private. The United States is second from the bottom. So we are the second, um, you know, down at the bottom, second from the bottom in terms of the percentage of our population that is covered with healthcare benefits. And we also stand out because if you look at how much spending is private, you know, most of these countries, either all or most of their healthcare spending is done through public dollars. We have, um, we're spending more than half of ours on um, in private dollars. And we're actually spending more than other countries per capita. So if you look at the United States at the bottom, the yellow bar is how much we spend in public dollars and the orange is how much we spend in private. And you can see that we're spending more in public per capita than many of these other countries are spending total per capita and they're covering everyone and providing good benefits and having good health outcomes. So we're already paying enough right now in the United States to have a universal healthcare system. We're just not doing it. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, part of that is because we've created this incredibly bureaucratic and bulky healthcare system. It's not actually ever been designed as a rational system, but we've seen through this privatization, this whole managerial class that has come in. This is you know, looking at the growth of physicians at the bottom in yellow versus the growth in managers. And you can see on the left that this is more than 3000% growth. Um, since the 1980s, but really taking off in the 1990s. And so a third of our healthcare dollars are going into this bureaucracy and not for healthcare. It's a very wasteful, complicated system. And it's not working. You know, we have even going into this year, we had about 30 million people who did not have health insurance. But since the recession that started in February and the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing a real ballooning of the number of people that are losing their health insurance. So this was a study done by the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation, just looking from the beginning of March to the beginning of May, they estimated that about 78 million people had someone in their household that lost their job. And then they looked at who of those people lost their insurance, who had insurance, and they found that about 26.8 million people lost their health insurance. Now that's three months ago. So, and we continue to have high numbers of people applying for unemployment every week. So we can imagine that it's continued to get worse. Next slide. And this is on top of a situation where even prior to this pandemic and recession, um, wages had really stagnated for the majority of people. This is looking at the bottom 20%, you know, in quintiles up to the top 20% in terms of income. And you see going back from the 1970s that particularly for those in the bottom 20, bottom 40%, even bottom 60 wages have really stagnated as you know of course healthcare costs and education costs and housing costs all these things have gone up people are just don't have the same income they had before next slide and this means that even people with health insurance are struggling to to be able to afford actual care so this is looking at families who have insurance and those who don't the ones in yellow are the ones that don't have insurance and they don't have the money on hand to have met a, deduct a deductible or out-of-pocket limit if they had insurance. But even those who have insurance 
about half of them don't have enough money to meet the deductible they have to pay before their health benefits kicked in, kick in. And many of them don't have, 63% don't have the money on hand to reach their out-of-pocket expenses. And so we're seeing a number of, you know, large percentage of people that skip care or delay care altogether. And we see everyone is financially vulnerable in, um, if they have a serious illness, we find that about 60% of of uh, bankruptcies are due to medical illness and about three quarters of the people who went bankrupt had some form of coverage going into that. Next slide. So the COVID-19 pandemic has just taken all of these problems with our healthcare system and really just exposed them and blown it wide open. And this is a graph, just, you know, a chart, just looking at the US in terms of cases compared to other countries. And, and of course, we all know that we've taken off. And this was actually prior to the real takeoff that we're in right now. We've, we've never finished this first wave, but um, we see the, the failure of people to be able to get healthcare, of the system to be able to have the flexibility to be able to get resources where they're needed. We see states fighting with each other over supplies. It's a real mess. Next slide. And so what I like to say is if we look at the United States as an experiment, because really we're the only industrialized nation that treats healthcare as a commodity over the last 40 years, what we see is a failure of this system. If it was an actual experiment, we would have ended it on ethical reasons. We have the most expensive system. We have relatively poor outcomes, increasing health disparities, a high number of preventable deaths. We're losing our doctors. Burnout is rampant. And we have high numbers of people who are either uninsured or underinsured. Next slide. So what happened with the Affordable Care Act in 2009-2010? It was based on a model that came out of a right-wing think tank, the Heritage Foundation. It was first tested at the state level in Massachusetts under government, Governor Romney and then picked up by the Obama administration as a model for the whole country. And it basically approaches trying to achieve universal coverage by requiring people to, to buy health insurance and then using large amounts of public dollars to subsidize and even market the purchase of that health insurance with a very minimum benefit, sorry, minimum benefit package that in fact has been watered down and it continues to be watered down under the Trump administration. Next slide. So what are we talking about when we say we need a national improved Medicare for all or a single payer system? It means a unified risk pool that every person living in the, in the nation is in the system. This makes it the most uh, simplest and the most efficient Everybody contributes in based on their ability to pay. Right now, the United States has a very regressive health care financing system. Uh, all medically necessary care is covered. So we have to get away from this body part medicine where we say, well, we'll cover certain parts of you, but not your you know, mental health or vision or dental or hearing or these kinds of things. Simplified administration, one system with one set of rules, both saves money, but also makes it really easy for health professionals and patients to navigate. And under the system, every physician, every health professional is in the system. So people have a full choice. They don't have these narrow networks that, re that restrict them that private insurance uh, companies use. And decisions are made by health professionals and their patients. There's not this middle person that's trying to obstruct the provision of care in order to make a profit. This allows us to focus on really preventative and timely care. We're talking about a system that doesn't have any out-of-pocket costs so that there are no financial barriers to care and allows us to do real planning at the national level and get the data you know, of what our healthcare outcomes, which we can't really get right now. It's all, much of it is proprietary to be able to do real planning. And there's transparency and accountability to the public. So we know how our healthcare dollars are being used. And I think that might be the last slide. Is there one more? Nope, that's it. So that was the very quick run through of our healthcare right now and what we need to do. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. I know that that was a short amount of time for all that you know about this and hopefully we'll get to hear uh, more from the question and answer. I, I'm struck by the phrase, I know that this is gonna stick with me when you said we're already paying for a national healthcare system. We're just not doing it. Um, I think that's very uh, a good thing to bear in mind when people go, how will we pay for it? We already are. Um, so thank you for your perspective and thank you for your work on this very important issue. Um, next, we're going to hear from Glenn Simpson. And Glenn is an activist, advocate, an ally, and an artist. 
And he's also a person in long-term recovery, and he believes in recovering loudly. So he holds a master's in clinical social work with a concentration in applied arts and social justice from U, uh, University of New England. And he's a certified alcohol and drug counselor as well. Uh, Glenn is an addiction and trauma therapist at Counseling and Trauma Therapy Associates in Portland, Maine. And he's the creative director, co-founder of RAD, the Radical Recovery Art Directive. Glenn's goal is to broadcast a message of hope, understanding, and compassion by using art to reduce stigma associated with healing from substance abuse and trauma. We're very lucky to have him with us today. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you having me here, and uh, thanks, too, to all the folks that have, uh, that have logged in today. And before I get started, you know, I just want to acknowledge um, that what we're experiencing in our community today is a pandemic within a, within a pandemic. We have COVID-19 and we have the, the opioid crisis. And um, I'm not comparing the suffering that folks are enduring here. I, I, I think it's important to state uh, the facts. Uh, this year in Maine, we've experienced 122 deaths from COVID. And, and this year we've experienced 130 opioid deaths in Maine. If those projected numbers are, are, are true, more people will die in Maine from drug poisoning, from drug overdose than at any other time in our history. And I often say that we're not talking about a moral issue here. We're not talking about a criminal justice issue here. We're, we're talking about a brain issue here. A substance use disorder is a preventable and, and treatable brain disorder. Recently, I, I attended the governor's opioid summit, and, and while people were speaking in very empathetic ways and touting the changes that have been made and the accomplishments in, in our state, I, was, I felt disappointed. I didn't hear any bold solutions. I didn't hear any talk of decriminalization. I didn't hear any talk of legalization, of amnesty, of overdose prevention sites. I didn't hear a whole lot of talk about harm reduction. And that's why, that's why I've been asked here today. You know, in discussing a universal health care program, I believe that the population suffering from substance use disorders, they've got to be at the, at the top of our priority list. And it's estimated more people are going to die this year in the United States from drug poisonings than last year when we had over 70,000 deaths. Last year, more than 88,000 people died from alcohol-related causes. Combined, we're going to have more than 150,000 deaths this year from substance use disorder. And despite the fact that we have treatments that we know are effective, only, only one in five with opioid use disorder are receiving it, and only 6% of adults with alcohol use disorder receive treatment. And I really think that we've we got to ask ourselves, you know, why is that? And we can move on to another, another slide here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the folks that I've worked with. I want to give some examples of people that I'm working with so we can better understand the continuum of care and how their health care needs differ wide, widely and, and how the current system just doesn't support their, their recovery. Now, when I started working with Joe, he was unhoused, he was unemployed, he, he was depressed, he was intermittently abstinent from alcohol and cannabis. But today, he's stopped using all substances, he's living in his own apartment, he's involved in a 12-step program, he's on medication to help with cravings and depression, he's volunteering at a local rehab facility. And, and today we continue therapy, we're working on his barriers to healthy relationships and and how he can build a recovery community for himself. Um, in the future, he'd like a job similar to, to the volunteer work he's doing. However, if, if that job pays him more than $17,000 a year, he's gonna lose his main care. He's not gonna be able to pay for his medication. He's not gonna be able to afford therapy. And that's a setup. You know, that's a setup for a recurrence of symptoms, or more commonly known, it's a setup for a relapse. 
someone that I've come to admire for her resiliency is Sally, who is once labeled by a doctor as a chronic relapser. When I met her, she was actively using drugs and in, in attending an intensive outpatient program I was running. Um, Sally has been abstinent from opioids and methamphetamine for about a year now. She smokes cannabis on a daily basis and states it helps her with anxiety. Today, she's got her own home, she's employed, and again, the amount she earns could affect her care. Sally sees a physician for medication-assisted treatment. Unfortunately, She's also suffering from chronic pain, from severe tooth pain. And, and main care will cover having her teeth pulled, but they're not going to cover dentures. And she's very self-conscious, and, and she rarely smiles. And it has a, it has a profound effect on her self-worth. Most people don't, don't think of dental health as a, as a harm reduction strategy. And finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, about Fred. Fred has experienced significant trauma in his life. He's also suffered three drug poisoning, three overdoses in the last year. That is, Fred died and was brought back with naloxone. He's now on MAT, and that's allowed him to abstain from opioids, but he continues to use benzodiazepines to self-medicate his, his panic attacks. We work on harm reduction strategies together. Can he use in a safer way? Does he have testing kits? Does he have access to clean supplies? Uh, can he use in the presence of other people? Are, are those people supplied with naloxone and trained to use it? You know, therapy right now for us is about building trust in a supportive and non-judgmental environment. All three of these folks are on a continuum of care and we are employing harm reduction strategies, which brings us to the question, what are those strategies? What is harm reduction? You know, simply harm reduction is a philosophy that aims to reduce the harms related to substance use and risky behavior. Um, people don't need to stop using substances to receive care. If it, it meets people where they are in their journey. Uh, therapy identifies the psychological, the biological, and the social constructs that are contributing to the client's addictive process. It, it may also involve syringe exchange, uh, medication-assisted treatment, naloxone training, testing for HIV and Hep C and other community services, um, case management, help with housing, employment, and accessing medical systems can be part of it as well. Overdose prevention sites and decriminalizing people who use drugs are essential harm reduction strategies, and neither of which have been adopted in the United States. And we wonder why the death toll continues to rise. So, you know, what are the foundations of harm reduction? Well, first, um, drug and alcohol use is, is here to stay. And we, we need to work on minimizing its harmful effects rather than stigmatizing and, and criminalizing people. Second, we, we can improve lives without cessation of all substance use. Third, we need to ensure non-judgmental services and recognize that the client, the client's the primary agent. They're the expert of reducing the harms of their substance use. And finally, we need to acknowledge the research that proves poverty, racism, isolation, criminalization, and especially trauma affect people's vulnerability and capacity to deal with the harm that this disorder causes. So what would or what could universal health care possibly look like for those living with a substance use disorder? You know, what would that look like? Well, first, um, we need training for all health care workers in harm reduction strategies, and in particular, regarding their personal biases. Second, we need to integrate traditional medical systems with harm reductionists to create a, a holistic system that's going to include uh, screening, assessment, intervention, medication, case management, and ideally, let's coordinate all of that with primary care. A third, MAT, 
needs to be more widely available and coordinated with or distributed by trained primary care providers, especially in, in rural areas. And finally, we need to take the for-profit companies out of substance use disorder treatment. They've got fancy websites and they've got high prices and there's little to no oversight in some of these practices. There are centers that have been found guilty of using graduates to recruit patients and there is no reason why a family has to go broke in order to get treatment for the person that they love. We have a gold standard of evidence-based peer-reviewed treatment. It's, it's MAT, it's therapy, and it's building a recovery community. And our current system doesn't, doesn't adequately support any of that. And I get, I get pretty passionate uh, about this work. Uh, but uh, to wrap things up, you know, I, I believe main care has helped access healthcare tremendously, and we got a long way to go. Um, harm reduction and whatever that looks like on the continuum, it's, it's, it's an achievable outcome. It's, it's, you know, we're talking about a comprehensive integrated care system that can dramatically improve the lives of those with substance use disorders and their families. We can, we can reduce fatalities. We can, we can improve health disparities and we can decrease costs. And I'll wrap up with this. You know, there's, there's 23 million Americans suffering from active addiction today. And there's more than 25 million people in long-term recovery. Uh, and I'm one of them. You know, recovery is not only possible, recovery is probable. And, and we need a system that's going to support that. Thank you. I, I appreciate you, you all listening and logging in today. Well, thank you, Glenn. That was uh, very interesting. I love how you ended with recovery is not only possible, but recovery is probable. Um, that's a very optimistic uh, take from someone who really understands this field. And um, your uh, thoughts that you shared were very important to me. You know, I'm just retiring from being a school teacher in central Maine for 25 years. And the children that I've been working with these many years are very much affected by substance abuse disorders in their immediate family and extended family. Um, many of them have, uh, you know, lost parents or uh, are being raised by grandparents. Um, and and the, the extent, you know, as an educator and not a healthcare professional, the extent to which it affects their ability to be emotionally ready, socially ready, economically ready, for learning in the school setting, um, it's, it's pretty huge. Um, one of the things that's always bothered me too is even aside from um, substance abuse disorders, many of the children that I've worked with have, have had main care. They have had health care through the state, but many of them had family members caring for them that did not qualify for or have uh, medical care. And especially the dental care that, that nobody really had adequate dental care. And it is, it's a huge, um, factor that makes people unable to work and unable to socialize and mm -hmm. dealing with pain all the time and getting their dental care in the emergency room. Mm. Um, so thank you for touching on those very important issues that we need to address. We, we have the money, we need, we need to find the will and get out there and do it. Well, I'm very excited to hear from Dr. Bill Clark next. He has worked with Maine All Care, which is um, We've heard uh, mentioned a couple times today, and um, I am going to tell you a little bit about him. He's sad about healthcare injustices, and he's distressed that U.S. healthcare outcomes rank low. And he hopes Maine All Care can assist in establishing universal healthcare in Maine. Um, Dr. Clark's a graduate of Harvard Medical School, and he served in the CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service did a fellowship in health services research at the Harvard School of Public Health. And in addition, he directed the medicine residence at Cambridge Hospital and was assistant professor of medicine at Harvard. Dr. Clark practiced general medicine in Bath and was medical director of the Addiction Resource Center in Brunswick, Maine. He's a founding mem member of the Academy of Communication and Healthcare, served as its president and was managing editor of DocCom. So welcome, Bill. Thank you so much, Lisa. It is such a 
treat, as others have said, to be on a, on a panel with uh, such great speakers. And I hope I can do, th do them proud and uh, provide some additional information. I, uh, I should also say that by way of introduction that um, I've been a member of Physicians for a National Health Program. You saw those slides that Margaret showed that had the PNHP logo on them since its founding. And I've been working with Maine All Care, which is a chapter of the Physicians for a National Health Program for about a decade now, maybe a little bit less. At any rate, um, I'm very enthusiastic about the work. Um, sometimes I get a little discouraged. It goes slowly, slowly, slowly. And for reasons that are uh, very complex and woven tightly into our society, it's hard to... Um, get traction on what we're all trying to do. Um, our website for Maine All Care is, is in fact, maineallcare.org. We have about 40,000 people who have signed up to be a supporter. It's, it's free. Uh, we solicit uh, signatures and interest at uh, farmers markets and voting uh, booths and so on. Uh, we have 10 chapters throughout the state of Maine. And we advocate actively for the establishment of publicly funded health care coverage known at the national level as uh, Medicare for all at the present time. And we are aware and excited that it may take place in, a, uh, in one state before it goes national. And we're locally uh, hoping that Maine might be one of the places that it takes off. Go to the next slide, please. So, um, back one, yeah. Let's go back a couple. Yeah, the US is the richest and arguably the most powerful nation on earth. Uh, Margaret showed you the statistics, but the big question is why does the USA have millions of uninsured people have the poorest healthcare outcomes of any developed country. And in fact, in many cases, for example, infant mortality and maternal complications, it's worse than Cuba, just to pick a, a country that has so few resources. So why do we have so many health related bankruptcies? And where is the political will to affect change? So I'm, I'm a, I'm not ready for the next slide yet. Just stay on that one, if you would. So uh, note that Yui Reinhardt was a, a well-known economist who happened to live in Saskatchewan at the time they developed the fundamentals of Canada's uh, single-payer system, and then went on to help design Taiwan's quite amazingly equitable and comprehensive single-payer system. Yui Reinhardt was known for known to be outspoken and he famously said in response to this question why is it's the prices stupid today we say it's the it's the healthcare industrial complex we acknowledge that it's fueled by money and we note that every healthcare dollar spent is somebody's income so there's a lot of resistance to change at many many levels um it's clear that the political system nationally lacks political will, and it's too dysfunctional and deadlocked um, to actually spend the time uh, to undertake major change. It's also clear that halfway measures do not attack the fundamental problems, which I'll come to in a minute, um, so that both the public option and Medicare for some and lots of other uh, names like, catchy names like that, would preserve the dysfunctions of the current system and have the same inadequate, poorly functioning results, including the complexity, the administrative costs, and the profits, the issues that Margaret presented the data about. I'll take the next slide. So with all that's going against this, why should we advocate for publicly funded healthcare? It's clear that it supports foundational aspects of American democracy, working together and caring for each other. We just need to keep harping on that and demonstrating 
that we can do it. It's affordable. Every person pays according to their ability. Again, echoing what Margaret said earlier. Um, it's equitable. That is, it covers every single person. It doesn't leave anybody out. It's comprehensive. It provides for all needed health care. It's hassle-free. We can imagine a system like the one they have, for example, in France. We have a little plastic card. You stick it in the slot, just like you're buying an ice cream cone, and you get your care. It's all paid for, and there's no cash at the time of service. And it is hassle-free in the sense that for professionals like ourselves, that we get to care for people. We don't have to spend all the time now spent on paperwork, which is burning out physicians far and wide, specifically and most importantly, uh, primary care docs who are on the front lines. And uh, it's very sad to see that happening. I would just add as a PS about the why advocate question is that we're not talking about socialized medicine, uh, a widely misused uh, rubric these days. Socialized medicine would be where all the healthcare professionals in the whole system were paid by the state. That's not what we're advocating. We're adv advocating for people to um, uh, be delivering private care and get paid for the services that they provide. So looking at, again, kind of the next slide at this question about uh, where is the political will? Some of the will, of course, uh, needs to be vested locally. And that's why I'm so enthusiastic about Maine All Care, which supports a system that benefits the key community stakeholders. That is to say, first, patients that get the care when it's needed, prevention is emphasized. When, it, when one is ill, one can focus on getting well instead of the bills and the finances. Coverage is comprehensive. So if your vision is affected by some illness, uh, you get vision care. If you have dental problems, such as Glenn mentioned, you get dental care, not just a chance to pull your teeth, but to get fixed up. Um, and all this is without obstacles to early care, like big deductibles and co-pays and networks. There's lots of data showing that those co-pays and deductibles keep people from seeking care when they know they need it. And of course, that results in poorer medical outcomes for them, as well as higher costs for the system at large, which we would like to minimize. Uh, employees um, get health coverage, which is entirely portable. It doesn't matter that they're an employee. Um, they can um, just, there's no job lock. You probably would get higher wages because their employer is not paying for health care. And the startup of a new business would be a heck of a lot easier. I know some lovely people who've gone out on a limb to establish uh, local small businesses and they're uninsured, which is just horrible. I hate it. I hate seeing that. And finally, hospitals would get paid right on time and get predictable payments. There wouldn't be any, quote, charity care. Um, that would get rid of the us and them idea and it would be equitable and predictable financing with lower costs, lower total costs, leaving more money for community prosperity, um, education and other in infrastructure. And of course, there wouldn't be any need for collection jars anymore, which would be a wonderful thing. Go to the next slide. This is my last one. So what's Maine All Care been doing about this? Well, we're very active in testifying on relevant bills at the legislature and witnessing the activity, ongoing activity of the Healthcare Insurance and Financial Services Committee. We always have people there when they're having committee meetings that are in any way relevant to this issue. Um, a statewide survey that we conducted a, a bit uh, last year, mid-year, um, we sampled 4,000 people, not 
a randomized sample, but also not main all care supporters, just people like going to the post office or whatever. 69% um, of them said that health care for them was unaffordable, and 80% of those we talked to favored doing something about universal health care, either at the state or federal level. We commissioned a study by the Maine Center for Economic Policy, uh, which I won't go over in any detail, but the study basically showed what studies in other states have shown and showed what uh, Margaret has spoken about with uh, healthcare in other developed countries. That is to say, um, Maine spent $14 billion more or less for healthcare in 2017. And with a single payer study, run by the state, uh, not a study, but by a single payer plan run by the state. Estimates show that it would, total spending would decrease to a bit over $12 billion. Some of that money would come from lower reimbursement rates and a lot from net administrative savings, which means elimination of the private, private insurance administrative costs, marketing and profit, again, which Margaret talked about briefly. To move on from the study to what's happening right now, um, several towns in Maine have already passed resolves calling for their town uh, to notify the state legislature that they want universal health care. One of our largest towns, Bangor, did that uh, with no objections from anybody on the council. And it's also happened in Blue Hill um, and Penobscot. And I'm happy to say right now, um, in fact, two days from now, three days from now on Monday, my own town, Brunswick, will be considering a similar resolve and I expect it to pass in town. So some of the political will is showing up when these councils are saying to the state, we think for the citizens of our town and the citizens of the state, we should do something major. Finally, uh, Maine All Care has, is sponsoring a statewide resolve, which calls on the legislature um, to pass a uh, universal health care bill. We expect to start collect. We've got uh, the okay from the Secretary of State for the resolve language. Uh, we hope to start soon collecting signatures uh, and to be on the ballot next year or the year after, depending on how the pandemic goes and when we can uh, effectively and efficiently collect signatures. So you can tell from my mood and my comments that I'm very excited about this stuff and ready to, with other panelists, take on additional questions. Thanks so much for your attention so far. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bill. That was very interesting. and. Um, really reminded me that um, I am in the unique position of now being the only candidate in the U.S. Senate race that supports universal single-payer health care. The Democratic Party uh, in their national platform this past week rejected universal single-payer health care as a plank. And here in Maine, the Democratic Party has uh, nominated someone who also does not support single-payer universal health care. We know that our incumbent senator, Susan Collins, certainly does not support it. There's another independent on the ballot, but I'm not aware that that candidate supports it either. So it's kind of an interesting position to be in. Something that um, you said that really struck me was that um, every health care dollar spent right now is somebody's income. I hadn't really thought about it through exactly that lens, um, but of course that is, uh, you know, some, uh, an issue that would need to be addressed as part of um, uh, uh, fixing our health care system. I'm going to tell a little anecdote and then we'll be ready to entertain some questions from the audience, I had the opportunity to live in a country that had universal health care. From 1980 to 1984, I lived in Tokyo, Japan, and um, I was uh, married to an American, and we were uh, teaching English a little bit. I had two children, my two older children were both born in Tokyo, and we had uh, public health care from the Japanese government. Um, I believe it was tied to the fact that my husband paid taxes. They had a flat tax, 10% income tax in Japan at the time. 
But even though neither one of us were Japanese nationals, we received health care, as did our children. So my experience of universal health care was that if my baby was sick, I had to walk about two blocks to the local pediatrician's office at, without an appointment. My copay was about $3 to have the doctor see the baby. If the they decided that the baby needed amoxicillin or something, um, they gave me the medicine right there at the doctor's office, but they would only give me two or three days worth because they said, we want you to come back to make sure that they, you know, see how the baby's doing. Um, and that was a, a really amazing experience. They also had amazing public transportation and, and many other great things. Um, and of course, they didn't have much of a military budget at all in 1980 to 1984. So it's been really interesting to me to talk to people over the years about the possibility of universal health care at the national level and have so many people in the U.S. tell me it isn't possible. We couldn't afford it. It can't be done. And um, because I've experienced it and actually, you know, that's my, I've had that lived experience, um, I realized that the, in, the invisible elephant in the room is this gargantuan Pentagon budget in addition to the money that's being wasted on administration and, and isn't delivering any health care, as Margaret pointed out, we've got this giant federal budget slice of the pie every single year that's harmful to our health, driving climate change, um, you know, literally maiming and killing people in other countries. And that is why we're told we can't afford universal single payer health care. Nobody wants to talk about, well, what, what, you know, why can't we? Where is that money going? Um, and uh, you all know that this is kind of my uh, the area of my work for many years now, so I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now, but I wanted to connect those dots. Okay, we are starting to see some questions come in from the audience. Given that one of the drivers of increasing costs is the endless increase in medical technology, in various European countries, there is an auxiliary track of pay extra private care to make use of this which is philosophically inconsistent with equity, but would become very expensive if rendered equitable. How would a Medicare for all system deal with that? Maybe we'll start with you, Bill, and then see if the others on the panel want to weigh in. I think, uh, you know, if there's one thing I've learned over the years, as have others who have gotten into this area, it's very complicated. And so you can't say in advance, how everything would be fixed. And um, it's clear that uh, many countries do have uh, supplemental policies. There's no reason we couldn't do that as well. Even though we covered everybody, we could offer um, special services of some kind or other um, to those who wanted to pay extra. But what we must do is make sure that everyone has the same access to basic and fundamental services. That's the key to making it uh, equitable uh, and possible at the financial level. Margaret. Uh, yeah, ahead. I'd like to weigh in on that. Um, first off, we have to recognize that not all technology is good. In the United States, a lot of the technology is developed for profit, not necessarily because it's something that benefits the health of people. So one part of having a actual health system is that you have a body, you know, a system that's not for profit, you have a body that can actually evaluate the technology of whether it's useful. Um, I think in other countries, they are very high tech. I um, have an, a friend who actually was the minister of, of, the, of the Canadian healthcare system, and he worked in Congress um, as well for one of the members of Congress that was a big single payer supporter. And he talked about his son who lived in Australia and how he had a condition. And when he went to get authorization from the system to get surgery for his condition, they initially authorized one procedure and then they contacted him a week later and said, actually, we want to send you to a higher tech center for a more expensive procedure because the outcome will long term will be better if you do this. So that was a system that really is about what's best for the patient. Um, and there's no reason that we couldn't do that here. We have so many people with chronic health conditions because they can't access care and because our whole kind of environment is not set up to support health. And that's another benefit of a universal system when the government is responsible for paying for it there's a high incentive to change public policies to make sure that preventative and public health measures are a big part of, of what you do um, and then just lastly i would say that you know every system around the world the 
there's a pressure from the capitalists to profit from it. And so to introduce privatization and, and these extra special you know, plans and benefits, we see that in Canada and the UK and elsewhere. And so um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good way to go. We advocate for a single system with everybody in it that's comprehensive because then you have that social solidarity that requires us, all of us from the top to the bottom to defend that system, make it the best system that it is. Um, and as soon as you start ending, you know, adding in these extra insurances and things, you're adding more bureaucracy and more cost. It, it is true that in France and other places, they do have supplemental insurances, but it's a completely different beast than what we experience in the United States. The French uh, set extra insurances, it's a mutual insurance. It's designed to actually pay for healthcare, not make a profit. So um, I think that we can't really compare our insurance, health insurance in the United States to health insurances in other countries, it's apples and oranges. Um, and so ideally what we're asking for is a single comprehensive system that doesn't require those. Glenn, did you want to weigh in on this question? You're muted. I think um, both of our doctors, you know, did a great job explaining all that. And um, just, the, you know, the idea of, you know, for-profit healthcare, you know, the, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense to me, and I understand that it's it's going to be complicated um, to figure this out. But you know, we have the technology to send a drone from Denver to blow something up halfway across the world. I think we can help Sally with her dental needs. Well put, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, here's a question. Uh, working in mental health between 1970 and 1990, I saw how the decision to take substance disorders out of the Medicare disability eligibility hurt a lot of people in getting treatment. Fast forward to the 2000s, the policies still fall far short of providing appropriate treatments based on all the real life situations, especially poverty and social stigmatism that is evident and shown by healthcare providers themselves. What can we do at the policy level, Glenn? It's a really great, uh, really great comment. And, um, you know, a place that I really like to begin um, with folks, you know, today I was just kind of doing, you know, harm reduction 101 um, with folks who are, who are tuning in who may think that, you know, harm reduction is counterintuitive um, to folks, you know, getting well or finding recovery, however you want. Um, you want to put it. I think a really important place to start is, is really um, informing folks about how powerful stigma is in our communities and, and teaching uh, the use of, of non-stigmatizing language. It's a very, very simple place um, to start. I had an opportunity to, to speak to students in, in the pharmacy department at the university of New England, and, and there were, uh, you know, pharmacists who were uh, years of experience working in the field, saying, uh, you know, they didn't like their their shop uh, filled with all of these people. And speaking to students um, like that, it's a very very simple place uh, to start. How about we start treating folks with uh, some dignity? Start treating people with some respect. Start treating people with compassion start using non-stigmatizing language. You know, I'm a firm believer that the opposite of addiction is uh, connection. And that connection can happen anywhere along this, um, this continuum. Um, I hope that, that helped answer a bit of your question. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one? Here's a question. How can communities of, oops, they jump around on me, sorry. How can communities of color, especially those who live in the Gulf of Mexico and Cancer Alley, now called Death Alley, along the Mississippi River, the Bronx, and, um, sorry, they keep jumping on me. Can't, I can't hold the chat still. Uh, and indigenous reservations in the Southwest dealing with highly toxic 
um, environmental factors plus COVID exposure get top quality medical care. Um, Bill, do you want to take a I'll just, I'll just um, speak. I, I heard um, Angela Davis speak on a podcast today about political will and getting things done. And she was saying that, you know, the current movement, Black Lives Matter Plus, uh, about equity, um, is the kind of thing that we have to undertake in order to uh, free people from the shackles uh, that you were describing uh, by of specific populations, you know, we can change that stuff. We just have to make the big decision. And that again, is a matter of uh, protesting both in the public way that people have been doing uh, in the last several weeks, uh, but also by uh, contacting uh, the appropriate uh, people who can affect that change. If I could weigh in um, a couple of things, you know, one is, as I alluded to or mentioned before, if you have a actual national health care system that's not for profit, but that's actually for health, it does have an impact on policy like environmental policy and other policies that impact health because the, the country now has a vested interest in the health of its population and keeping them healthy would, you know, theoretically cost less, certainly less than, than poisoning people. So that's an argument for a national improved Medicare for all. Also under a national healthcare system, um, people have the right to get health healthcare wherever they want it. So if, if someone lives in a state, they develop a condition that is best treated in a facility outside of their state or just outside of their county or whatever, you're in the system, that facility is in the system, you can go wherever you need to go. So. Um, the idea is hopefully with health planning is to start to develop, to develop real centers of excellence around the country and actually have real planning of, of what we need uh, for people. And then a concept that I think we need to talk more about, I work with the uh, Howie Hawkins campaign. I helped Howie Hawkins, who's running for president on the Green Party ticket, write his health plank. And um, we start with the National Improved Medicare for All, but we actually do believe that a socialized healthcare system is the best um, because it, it gets the profit out. You know, we need to be able to uh, make sure that these health facilities are there and that they're serving the communities who need them. But another aspect of his plan it builds off of a, a bill that Ron Dellums had put into Congress in the uh, in the 20th century, which is community control over the healthcare services. And so different communities have different priorities and different needs, and they need to have input into what health services are developed, you know, delivered in their communities and how those services are delivered. So I think, you know, particularly for folks in the Gulf states or Council or Alley, um, to be able to prioritize what it is that they're needing would be important. Uh, we need to shift the power in the healthcare system, we need to shift the power from right now where it is this medical industrial complex back to people and health professionals. And, and um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Glenn, did you have uh, something that you'd like to say about this? Or um, I think, you know, part of my, you know, philosophy is recovering loudly. And, you know, I, I would certainly encourage um, folks uh, that are out there um, to get loud too about the you know the issues that um, that affect you and the communities that you that you care about. Un unfortunately, you know um, the people in, in power uh, aren't so <laughs> uh, they, they they don't hear our 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 voices usually. It feels to me so get loud. I just have to insert here the. First, I became aware of Dr. Margaret Flowers was that I saw her in a video being um, removed from a Senate hearing where health care reform was being discussed and there was no single payer, no single payer advocates at the table. And she was part of an organized effort of various health care professionals who stood up one by one and said, you don't have single payer at the table. How is this a meaningful discussion? And uh, she was removed and somebody else stood up and I said, I like that woman. I want to know that person. So That's getting loud. <laughs> it, it is getting loud and it was uh it made me it made me it inspired me 
Um, this was an interesting question, I think, that all three of you probably have some thoughts on. We've seen that support for Medicare for All continues to grow. What is a reasonable timeline for implementing a single payer system? Uh, Margaret, you alluded to this a little bit in developing Howie Hawkins' platform for kind of a rollout of these, um, this remediation. How long until this is politically viable and how long would it take to transition to a new system? So those are really two questions. When will the political will become overwhelming? And then once the political will was there, how, how quickly could we do this? Margaret, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to start with that. Good question. Um, you know, the reason that um, we formed popular resistance is because that's how we develop the political will. When the people lead, the leaders naturally have to follow. And so I think if I look back over the you know last decades uh, and look at you know, kind of our knowledge of how social movements go through phases. Um, we're at a very important point now in the in the phase of, of winning National Improved Medicare for All, where we have real consensus among the public, and we also have a real need for it right now, particularly with the pandemic. And and so, if there were ever an opportunity to win this, now is the time. But as you know, Glenn said, it it's means that we have to be loud, we have to build power, we have to organize. At the HOPE campaign, we really focus on national because we believe that we can have a national improved Medicare for all system now. Um, the environment between Canada and the US are very different. And so I don't think we need to look back at what happened to Canada and use that as a template for how we win national improved Medicare for all in the United States. And so if we're organized in our communities, if we're hounding our uh, candidates that are running, if we're running candidates like Lisa, who are strong on this platform, if we're willing to get in the streets and, and, and be loud, uh, that's how we're going to build the power and, and shift this and, and win this. And once we do, how do we, you know, implement this? It's really simple. If you look at John Conyers legislation, which was our gold standard for, you know, maybe 16 years or so before he left Congress, um, he basically said that when when the bill passed, you know, whatever month, it would begin on January 1st of the year that's at least, you know, at least a year from the date that it passes. So if it passes in July of 2020, it would be implemented starting January 1st of 2022. Um, and this gives us plenty of time to do the planning. Every health professional in the United States has a national health provider number. So we already have that system in place to do the billing for our, for our providers. It's a matter of transitioning workers. Somebody brought this up earlier, but we have to make sure that workers who are displaced from the system are prioritized for hiring into the new system or receive salary support and job training for a period of years so that they can transition out. Um, it's a matter of, of you know, evaluating our facilities. In the Conyers bill, very importantly, he actually would buy out the for-profit facilities so that they don't get turned into luxury condominiums or retail space, but we actually have that infrastructure for our system. So um, in a, a little, at least a year, I think we can roll this out in the United States. And um, that's what they did in, in uh, Taiwan. They actually took 18 months uh, to transition to their system. Just to add one, one comment and uh, a bit of history that, you know, when Medicare was passed, it took uh, just a little over six months to enroll everybody using postcards. There were no computers. Yeah, I mean, it if you got the will, you can make it happen. And, and it's a very straightforward process. And Margaret gave some more details about that. Glenn, you've unmuted. Did you want to say something about this also? Um, I th think that, you know, I, I love the optimism on on the panel, and I share it too. That you know this this could be this could be done in a year, and I feel you know myself and 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 others that we have obligation to um, to educate that this can be done. Communicate that to our communities, and then let's let's participate. Thank you. Um, I was shocked by a, a poll that I saw this past year that where Americans were asked, uh, what do you think is the best, the most important part of being a good citizen? And they said, voting. I mean, I please vote for me. Everyone who's watching this, if you're in Maine, please vote for me. Um, it is important. And, um, uh, you know, most of us that care about it take our children into the polls so they can see this is what we do. But to say that that is the most important action of a, a citizen, um, that is a very, very small lift, <laughs> and there are lots more uh, ways that we can advocate and agitate, and 
and basically demand that our representative government represent us. Um, this is a related question that I think is interesting. Um, what specific Senate bills can be introduced and supported to release the grip that profit prevents uh, change to happen? Margaret, you've run for the Senate before and you've just been helping Howie with a presidential level uh, policy development. What, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, the only way that we're going to get profit out of our health care is by creating a system that takes profit out of our health care. That's either a national improved Medicare for all or a national health service. Um, and so, you know, Senator Sanders has introduced legislation. We actually pushed him to introduce a companion bill to HR 676 because HR 676 came out of Physicians for National Health Program, out of the Physicians Working Group. And so it was really what PNHP saw as you know, the gold standard of what we needed. Um, so I would love to see uh, a senator introduce a companion to, to HR 676, although we don't have 676 anymore in the House, introduce that in the Senate. And basically it, it would put every single person in the United States into the healthcare system, whether you are a citizen or not. If you live in the US, you're in the healthcare system. Everything is covered and there are no out front, you know, upfront costs and there are no profiteers. We need to also, I think nationalizing the pharmaceutical industry is something that's being talked about more. And, um, and that makes a lot of sense as a, that would be a very big step in the United States since the majority of our research, you know, you know, uh, groundbreaking research is done in public institutions, but then we turn it over to the private industry to do the final production and marketing. And so we invest all this money in taxpayer dollars and then turn it over them to make record profits. And that really makes no sense. We could start using the, you know, the, well, we shouldn't be really making a lot of money off of our pharmaceuticals anyway, if you look at other countries like China that, you know, oppose that type of approach. Um, but it really, it, it, it would save a lot of money if we nationalize the pharmaceutical industry. It would make sure that everybody had what they needed. Also that we could prioritize because we're seeing pharmaceutical companies not necessarily making drugs that we need anymore because it's not profitable or making drugs that are very cheap and charging a lot of money for it. So that needs to end. I've heard uh, what you just described as um, uh, socializing the costs, but privatizing the profits. Um, and, and I think we've been seeing that in even the development of um, the COVID-19 uh, either treatments or vaccinations. We're seeing a lot of public money poured into um, corporate entities that presumably intend to profit. I'm curious about, um, you know, one approach is uh, positive legislation that uh, creates the system that we want to see. Um, I know this is another field, but I was recently involved in Maine in helping uh, lobby for the passage of a law at the state level that uh, outlawed uh, using native mascots in schools, which obviously isn't, well, it's a psychological issue actually, so it is kind of a medical issue. But in any case, it rem when you were talking, it, it made me think, well, maybe a, a simple approach might be to make it illegal to profit off human misery and off people's healthcare needs. Is that a ridiculous idea? I, I tend to think out of the box, so you can tell I me. I like I like bold ideas. <laughs> you know, uh, just saying you can't profit though basically means that the people that are in control of the system will find a different way to profit, and so it will leave us with less of a healthcare system. Um, I love out of the box thinking too, uh, but I think that the way that we end the profit in our system is to create a national system that is not based on profit. Maybe I should just ask the panel, what's your most out of the box idea about healthcare? <laughs> Don't be afraid to share it. We're not going to, you know, uh, make you do it. But what, when, if you, if you were, you know, in charge of the country, what would you do that maybe seems impossible right now, but in an ideal world, you could do it? It's too big for my imagination, Lisa. <laughs> I start small and you know, and then the world in, in which I'm operating in, in, in a place where uh, I often get a lot of pushback, is talking about uh, is talking about legalizing all drugs, talking about legalizing um, all drugs from from cocaine to to cannabis, um, 
to, to opiates. You know, uh, the Portugal model is one that I refer to people, uh, people to um, many times in, in this discussion. And, um, you know, that's, that's a discussion that can uh, often uh, get pretty heated on, uh, on social media or, or uh, even at the family dinner table sometimes. I agree completely with you, Glenn, that, you know, we need to legalize uh, drugs and take it out of the criminal justice system and put it into the healthcare system that, that just makes common sense. And I, I'm glad to see that there's actually, it feels like the political will on that is starting to change or the public consensus on that is beginning to change. I really love the model used in uh, Cuba, used in Venezuela, where um, health professionals are really seen as part of the community and they're trained um, to be focused on the health of the people in their community and they use a real community approach of having clinics um, in every community and so doctors like you experienced in Japan are readily available and then they have you know medical centers with more services that people can be sent to if they need that they have tertiary care centers with more you know higher level of services that people can be referred to, but it's really grounded in the community and people knowing each other, knowing their health professional and having that, you know, relationship that really improves the health. And, and I really believe we need to shift the power in our system because there's so much distrust of the medical, of the health, you know, profession in the United States right now. And it's, and the, our current system has just destroyed the integrity of health professionals because you can't, do what you know is best for your patients. It's, it's why people are burning out. And so, you know, returning the power to the people to me is critical. I remember the first time, probably about 15 years ago, that I became aware that my healthcare providers were as angry at the insurance company as I was. You know, for a while, I guess, as a as a patient, I just sort of assumed, okay, well, they're both part of the, you know, system that I'm working with. And I, and I began to realize, oh, they're really mad. Because, of course, you go to medical school and you spend lots and lots of uh, your time and your money and your effort to prepare for a career where you're going to be helping people. And then these, this profit uh, entity inserts itself between the provider and the patient and the and the providers are very very frustrated by that and angered by it rightly so um, that was a that was an eye opener for me it's the divide and conquer you know where the insurance companies I always used to say that they've got the patients and the doctors both frustrated and fighting with each other while they're just sitting back and raking in the money and mm -hmm. and um, in in Albuquerque, I visited a clinic called Casa de Salud that was a community-based clinic. It was built and structured based on what the community wanted. And someone mentioned collaboration between the community and the physician. That's critical. I know that one of the features of uh, other countries that invest in um, healthcare for their population, another thing that they do is they provide a free public higher education all the way through medical school or dental school. Um, and they do that not because they necessarily uh, want to be unfair and, and, and privilege certain people to be educated. They do it because they see it as a public uh, need, uh, the common good. Don't we need trained healthcare professionals? Yes, we do. So therefore, if a student shows aptitude in those areas, the government says, hey, why don't you go to medical school? And now in the U.S., the decision to go to medical school is a pretty heavy, it's a big uh, risk that people need to take. Some people have family money behind them, but that's a lot of family money. And many people go into uh, debt for years and years. I'm wondering about, I wasn't aware that there was such a, t um, a uh, doctor burnout problem, Margaret, until you I began corresponding with you around this. I wonder what happens to people that have invested a great, you know, have taken out big loans to invest in their education and then they get into the profession and realize, wow, I'm not even sure I can survive this uh, emotionally. And then, but they're kind of struggling under this debt load. Um, it's, at the simplest the problems level. Problems are all related. Sorry, yeah, Bill, go ahead. At the simplest level, we're talking about burnout, uh, but you need to look just one step further to find drug and alcohol addiction and suicide. You know, it's a terrible plague on the medical profession right now. 
you've absolutely uh, hit the nail on the head, Lisa. Yeah, this was one of the things that, you know, drove me to really pursue this full time is that a lot of the physicians that I knew that I had a lot of respect for that I knew through medical school and residency, I saw them leaving clinical practice and going into medical directorships and pharmaceutical companies. So they were, uh, they were frustrated with the system of providing direct patient care and going into these, you know, jobs that have a good stable income, fewer work hours, things like that. And I just saw this kind of drain of the doctors I knew who really cared about their patients and felt like I couldn't do anything about that, you know, being a mother of three and practicing and trying to do advocacy. Um, I, and I was a little optimistic back then that I could do it much faster, but, but we've made a lot of progress. Well, um, the pandemic has been alluded to several times. We probably, we don't have a lot more time left to discuss, but I would be interested to hear your thoughts on the particular opportunities that this pandemic offers I know that many people here in Maine who did not understand why universal health care was so important before the pandemic, they understand it a lot better now. How can we capitalize on this opportunity? I'm, I'm assuming the pandemic is going to be with us for a little while yet, um, but uh, you know, can we turn this problem into the opportunity to finally get the health care that we need? I think it calls on all of us to keep advocating for what we've been, uh, what we believe in and what we've been advocating for for a while, but to do it, as Glenn would say, more loudly. Um, I'm working right now on a letter to the editor. That sort of thing seems small, but in the end makes a difference. And uh, yes, so we just need to be louder about um, what, what the pandemic has caused and how it doesn't need to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be very different um, the next time we get a pandemic because it's going to happen again. So let's, um, let's learn from this and put in place some mechanisms to provide what people need um, so that the next time it's not such an incredible disaster. Glenn, I know that substance abuse disorders have become um, more uh, extreme, more of a crisis in the pandemic. Um, is there an opportunity there? There's a huge opportunity there. Um, again, we're in this place of where we can, you know, uh, educate, communicate, and um, participate in a lot. If, if I was going to take, you know, a theme from this panel today, I'm hearing, hearing a lot about community and, uh, and collaboration. And what I've noticed in my own practice um, those dis diseases of despair, um, including substance use disorder. I've also seen um, a lot of courage in our communities of, of people, you know, picking up the 10,000 pound phone and, and giving a call and saying, you know, uh, you know, I started drinking again, or, you know, my, my son or my daughter is having a really uh, difficult, uh, difficult time. And it's been an interesting opportunity and an experiment with telehealth, uh, especially for me as a, as a clinical social worker working with people. I love doing artist therapy with people. I love clinical social work. I love the energy of that connection. And, uh, and I'm excited to say that that energy and that connection has still been available there um, using telehealth. Now, um, not all insurance companies are going to continue to pay for, uh, for telehealth. And this is a really interesting opportunity for clinical social workers, psychologists, and, and others um, to really petition and, and get loud uh, that telehealth has been working. It's been working. Um, you know, my practice has, has increased um, since the uh, since mid March, and I continue to work with folks uh, um, via telehealth, individuals, couples, uh, and families. Interesting. I was not thinking about telehealth, but of course that has been a, a big development. Margaret. Yeah, I'd love to weigh in because um, the recession, which you know, COVID kind of 
put things over the edge, but the recession was coming anyway. Uh, this is going to be a long-term recession. Uh, obviously, the pandemic is going to be with us for a long time, too, just looking at our failure to deal with it in the United States. Um, and so, you know, if we look back, the last time that we had a major health reform in the United States was following the financial crash of 2008, 2009, and we had about 48 million people who were without health insurance. Now we're uh, having a worse recession, probably a depression. We've got this you know, huge health problem. And now we also have, because the, the eviction moratorium has expired and states and cities are not really doing what they need to do, we're facing tens of millions of people who may be evicted from their homes. So we have a huge crisis. And this is a huge opportunity. Anytime you have these crises, it's an opportunity for change. And there's going to be change. The question is what kind of change that is up to who's the most organized and who's able to build the most power. We already see how the profiteers, the neoliberals are trying to use these opportunities to increase their fortunes. And in fact, they have through the congressional bills that have been passed have really fed this wealth divide even more. So we at Popular Resistance have been saying for a few years that the 2020s were going to be a time of a huge turning point because all these crises are coming to a head, the climate crisis as well, and in the U.S. losing power in the world as a as a you know as a dominant country as a superpower that's changing. And so there's going to be real change, but we have to be leading what that is with a vision of what we want to see and then organizing. And so we started a popular resistance school on social transformation that runs through the phases of social movements, the tasks, the obstacles that people will run into and how we counter those obstacles and how we build power. So that's a free school at popularresistance.org if people wanna check that out. It's you know eight videotaped classes. Um, and so I think this is our responsibility right now. And what's exciting to me is you know we've worked with people around the country that are involved in resistance on a variety of issues. And what I'm seeing now as opposed to what I saw 10 years ago during the last health reform process is people are making the connections. And so people who are calling for a general strike are saying we need Medicare for all. People who are focused on Black Lives Matter are saying we also need Medicare for all. So we're seeing a, a broader calling for this and that's how we win through a movement of movements that's mobilized. When I win this election, I hope you will all uh, be willing to serve as health policy advisors as you can see, this is not my area of expertise, but I certainly have learned a lot today, and I really, really appreciate your taking the time to share what you know with us. Um, thank you so much. We're about out of time. I'm just going to uh, mention to the uh, audience that our next webinar is August 5th in the Way Forward series. It's also about a, a health, uh, an issue that has health impact, and that is the CMP corridor which is uh, Hydro-Quebec's attempt to, with CMP to cut a swath the size of the New Jersey turnpike through the Maine woods in order to deliver very dirty energy from the mega dams up in Canada to Massachusetts, which thought it was buying clean energy when it agreed to the deal. Um, we're going to have uh, uh, John Gonzalez, who is a member of the impacted communities in uh, Canada with us to speak. We're having Don Neptune Adams, who is a Penobscot journalist and um, they uh, have all, are also part of the impacted people as the, as the transmission line would run through Maine. And we're having Jonathan Carter, a past Green Party candidate for governor, who's uh, heads up the Forest Ecology Network. And um, I know that the CMP corridor resistance is also uh, very much on people's minds. So I hope that people will consider joining us for that. We have a minute for each of you to make a closing statement. I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Glenn, do you want to start? Uh, I will just say that I saw a question on here. Someone was asking about the artwork on, on the slides. And I was involved in a, in a project with uh, a group of men who were in uh, early recovery from substance use disorder. And we were, we were testing the effectiveness of art as therapy uh, on folks in, in early recovery. And some of that artwork uh, was, was created by um, by those men. And we did find that art as therapy uh, was a great way to uh, perhaps get in touch with some emotions that had been um, buried in there and we had a good time. So I appreciate that question and I wanna say thanks. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thanks for everybody out there. And uh, thank you to, uh, to the panel as well. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Bill? Sure, um, I'm just gonna build for a moment on 
Glenn's uh, motto about uh, educate, communicate, and participate. That's that's what people who are tuning into this and paying attention need to do. And I hope that uh, many folks will uh, agree to help Maine All Care do its thing better than we've been able to do it in the past. Now, the time is right. The time is ripe. And uh, we need to get loud. So I, I hope people will join us in this effort. Thank you. Margaret? Yeah, I want to thank you for organizing this and for running, Lisa. I know it's not an easy thing to do to run for U.S. Senate, but uh, a prominent role that third party campaigns play, even if we don't win, is to push the issues and to change the dialogue and how we discuss these things. So I'm really excited that you're running on the National Improved Medicare for All. I did put a link in the uh, chat to Howie Hawkins Health Platform if people want to check that out, as well as a link to the Popular Resistance School, which is just at popularresistance.org. And you'll see it right at the top where the menu, you can click on school. So there's something that all of us can do you know, as simple as writing a letter to the editor as Bill is doing, talking to your neighbors, talking to your family, and there's lots of resources out there. Physicians for National Health Program, I'm sure Maine All Care has lots of resources on its website. Popular Resistance does too, through our HOPE campaign. So, you know, just that we build power by continuing, as you said, educate, organize, and mobilize. So that's our, our task. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Yes, this team that I'm serving as the spokesperson for in this U.S. Senate campaign is a huge team. They're very, very talented and very dedicated. We'd love to have anyone else who wants to join in help us out. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here and for giving your time and just for, you know, working so sincerely to make our world better for everybody. Thank you. Thank Be you. Well. <clears throat>